I have the great privilege of welcoming Professor Dominique Boucher, who is of French nationality but working in Denmark and has done for many years. I had the pleasure of spending two days at a round table in Singapore with a range of colleagues, including Dominic, who spoke on various issues. Fascinating man. Cool. Very entertaining speaker, no pressure. Um, but a wonderful mind and wonderful ideas. It's a great privilege to have somebody of Dominic's standing in Townsville. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, <laughs> well, you know the issue of um, art and in, uh, innovation in uh, in our time is puzzling me. It's something I, f I found very uh, puzzling uh, because uh, sometimes. Uh, when you go in museum, you see uh, different kinds of arts, and they even open some uh, museums where they show uh, trousers and uh, dresses of some kind, and they call it art museum, and they only show uh, beautiful dress uh, from a specific brand even, and uh, they proudly uh, showing all this stuff. Also, you see artists that come up with uh, pieces of art, uh, but the most important thing seems to be themselves on the, on the stage. Um, so somehow, if, if you come with this idea that art is an important thing in, uh, in such times uh, that we're experiencing today, uh, it's some, it might sound strange. It might be the promoting, the promotion of a whole group of people who wants to be promoted. You know, we have to sponsor them or to buy their stuff and things like that. But that's not at all my idea. My idea is we have to make a distinction between art. Um, and uh, other kind of activities, and that if, if you work uh, and try to understand what human beings are and uh, what the history of mankind is, uh, you have to uh, promote a specific understanding of the concept, art. So, uh, as Peter Murphy asked me to reflect upon uh, innovation and art today, uh, I was uh, a little, uh, the word is not upset, but uh, you know, in a, a strange state of mind thinking about those museums I referred to before, those artists I referred to before. And then I came to think about what I read uh, many years ago. I was fascinated by an issue. How can people do things so bad towards other human beings? You know, that they torture each other, so human beings do beautiful things, but they also do terrible things. When you see a, a cat playing with a mouse, well, there is no, there is no harm. It's terrible to see, but uh, you know somehow that it's, it's, not, it's not the kind of, uh, of mentality that we have when we torture other people. And there is a guy called Georges Bataille, and, uh, I found out then that he had written about that. How can people torture each other? How can people do such things that animals would never do if they hadn't, it hadn't a real purpose, if it was just for enjoyment or for, uh, for putting people down? And uh, as I was reading him many years ago, I also figured, find out that he wrote about the Lascaux Caves. The Lascaux Caves in France are beautiful paintings. Actually, I have pictures of them. and. Uh, I can show you. Well, I had made such a thing like this one. We go further, and you will see it should come um, very soon, the Lascaux Caves. I would say that, oh, come on. Why does it do that? There you go. That's the Lascaux Caves. Have you seen such pictures before? Uh, it's amazing. You know. They were painted 17,000 years ago in the south of France. And in 1949, there took some little uh, some kids that were playing around there. And they uh, found this cave. And they realized they had 
but just playing. The Riyadh was something very special. So some people went there to study it, of course, and they figure out. Now we know they are 17,000 years old. And um, Bataille, who was interested in finding out how human beings are, can be so tough towards each other, he also tried to find out what this means. Why did they paint such things? And there were many theories about that. And one of the main ideas that he came about is that those human beings at that time were puzzled because they were leaving a state of mind to come into another. The animal state of mind to the human being state of mind. That was the main idea. Somehow he depicted that as if it was the uh, unique uh, moment. And many people believe that he thought it was really in this minute, 17,000 years ago. And now we know it's not like that. It has been a very long process. But the very idea that, that a change happened at the moment of time, and we know now it's about 40,000 years ago, and you know there have been human beings on your continents for 50,000 years, and they did bring art uh, with them somehow. They developed something similar, uh, because um, uh, people believe that it's 2 million years ago that some specific things happen, you know, there is a whole, a whole evolution of what human beings could do, have been able to do, and in connection with uh, what they, for instance, that they could eat, uh, uh, something that was cooked because they could figure out how to, uh, to maintain fire and uh, produce fire and then cook food in order to, to eat, and then they didn't have to sleep that much because what they were eating could be digested fast and they could get a lot of calories so they had time to play and to interplay and interact, to stay with the children maybe, whatever. So there's all this, we know a lot about it today, um, but uh, it has been a long process um, that resulted in the brain becoming bigger, the ability to uh, also to make projections uh, about what we could do, like uh, the idea of a tool, uh, which is uh, something that you have to have an idea of what you're going to achieve. So this idea that you're, got, you're not using something to do something, but you are planning to do things in able to do other things. And this is really something that other animals are not really good at. But today we know that most of the things we earlier believed were uh, uh, very different in mankind from other animals are not. You have animals who actually do beautiful artwork somehow, you know, birds that make, uh, here in Australia, Australia, Australia they, they, they go and find some uh, uh, beautiful colors, blue colors that are not even uh, possible to, very easy to find, and then they make a, a whole pass for the brides. So the birds do that. Um, apes are also very, they have some kind of a culture that they, they, it's different from one place to another, they teach their children different ways and things. So it, somehow the ability, our abilities are already there in many, many different ways in the other human, no, other um, species. But um, human beings develop something as little by little um, and the uh, in, during the last 60 years, there have been a lot of work done in prehistory and uh, looking at uh, what we have, what we have in as testimonies around. And uh, even though this superiority of mankind has been broken in many ways, because we are just a, a kind of further elaboration, a much more complex uh, way of using all those abilities that other species do have. Um, there is one thing that remains that's really different, and this is imagination. That we actually do produce some ideas of what we can do, and also produce ideas of things that are not there. And this is what George Bataille was stressing when he was looking at the uh, Lascaux caves. He was, uh, he was pointing out that though in those caves, they were painting animals and not human beings. That was pretty strange. Why didn't they, they could see themselves in the river? I mean, they could also see their cells. Uh, I can see you. I could try to paint you. No, they were painting human, big animals, great big animals. And um, so he was wondering, how come the only drawing you find is a very little uh, symbolic kind of a man uh, that is 
depicted in such a way it doesn't look like anything, whereas all the other things you see in, the, in those caves are beautifully depicted with really details, you know, bisons and, and deers, and with such beautiful quality artistic uh, skills. Why didn't they paint human beings? So he came up with that idea that maybe the, uh, what they were doing were trying to express themselves uh, at the moment where they were losing their own animal condition. That is, they were realizing that there is something strange there. Who are we? We kill, we kill those animals. But they are so much powerful than we are. Who are we? Are we doing them harm? Some, or harm? No, harm, you say. Yeah. Harm. Harm. Or uh, what are we doing? Maybe they were trying to figure out. And as they were puzzled and trying to figure out things, then they were painting it. So what we experienced there, he said, is the birth of art. And at the same time, the birth of the sacred. That means that there is something that human beings begin to understand, is that they do not realize the limit of their action and, the, and wh where do they belong, where do they come from, how come they actually are in this world, what's the meaning of all this? It's the birth of meaning, the birth of philosophy, the birth, not of religion yet. Uh, the sacred is not exactly the same as religion. The sacred is the experience of the limit and the experience of meaning. What is that? How come we kill those animals and they seem to be like that? Should we pay them back? Should we show them respect? Uh, sh can we get some of their, you know, they, they just go like this, um, just uh, cool, and, and we are not, we are possible, we're afraid. They don't seem to be afraid. But, I mean, they try to think about those things. How should we interact with those? Is there something else? Their minds was filled with new pictures, wonders, questions. That's a new thing. That's called imagination. And those pictures, wonders, concepts even, because of course they communicate. Other animals do communicate. You can communicate with your dog. Um, but the, the way this communication develops is that you can develop a new story new story, maybe you remember something, you dream of something, you don't know what's real and what's not real, and you can also, uh, in advance, uh, put some whole pictures of a whole world that's not there, but that's in your imagination, and also you can somehow express that to others. The one of the first ways you express it is by uh, communicating, uh, you could even say it's kind of music, that you, when you're dancing or, or uh, expressing yourselves, uh, at the beginning, when the language was not that developed, you could say uh, something like, uh, oh, you know, oh. Huh? And, you know and to express what you were fighting with this thing before. You can just think about uh, sometimes in movies today where actors are really uh, some with their bodies and some others just uh, talk quietly and so on. Uh, that at a moment of time, maybe they had to explain, so uh, we ran and we did this and this and this. And that, there was the basis for play, for, but it maybe became kind of ritual. What is a ritual? A ritual is uh, a way, it's, it's a tool uh, dealing with interaction. It's an interaction tool. It's, uh, that's a definition in anthropology somehow. A, a screwdriver, you use it to build something. A ritual, you use it to interact, to, to ensure that you are part of something. Uh, it's something to tell you, you belong there, we are together, and we, uh, we institute it somehow. That's also the definition of an institution. An institution uh, is precisely that, a tool for, for the community. And the ritual is a way of putting this tool into practice in something that can be experienced by the members of a community. So, at that, uh, at that time, that's the hypothesis of Georges Bataille. He wrote this in the 30s and up to the to 52 around, in different texts. And, uh, and at that time we didn't know that much about when exactly it was and how many other caves there were. And they didn't even know there were painters in Australia in the same way. Because those different uh, ways of uh, putting on walls experiences of the mind and of the 
relation to the world and to other human beings did appear between uh, in, uh, around 40,000 years ago. We, other caves were found nearby Lascaux that were 30,000 years old and just as beautiful. And uh, in, in the paintings you have here, uh, they are not caves. Uh, they are on walls. And the interesting thing is, it, they also, yeah, and they react, they react in a different way. Not big animals, but more signs. And, and, uh, and it, it can, um, people today say that one of the reasons must be that they have to, they were reacting to their surroundings also. They saw the traces on the ground, the paths, how do you call that? You know, the footprints and things and to follow. And, and that was important to them. So they developed another kind of logic and another kind of art based on their experience on the big, on, on, in the big um, field like that. Whereas those in Lasgo, they were living with those big animals and, and reindeers and buffaloes and, uh, and uh, then they were painted that. And also they could go inside the cave. And to go inside a cave, it, it was pretty tough because you had to bring fire to see anything and it was totally closed. So it has somehow that's not meant something very special to them. Why go hide there? They were not living there, not at all. It was more kind of a sanctuary. So they were going inside there doing something. And you can also, now we know that some, some of it was painted at that time, some of it at the other time, and they, we also know the techniques they used. And that's really interesting. I have no time to explain all that. But, it's, uh, but what's the most interesting for us as a subject today is that at that time, uh, it was different, different parts of the world. And it happened everywhere about the same time. 40,000 years ago, human beings created for the first time ever something that you can call art. Of course, you can go back uh, many years before. Uh, 200,000 years ago, every, almost every human being uh, that were living at the time, they, were, they could walk 30, well, uh, 20 miles to get stones that looks good you know, and, and bring them back in order to make tools on them. Why should they do that if they didn't have an aesthetic sense that they like colors and also symmetry and things where they're building their tools? But other animals do that. The, I mean, the aesthetic sense, we know that today. Fascination of specific colors. As I said, those birds in Australia that also fly to, to think, find some blue stones and things, well, that's not specifically human. The aesthetic sense is much broader uh, than the, uh, the, the human experience. What makes art is not aesthetics, that's the point here. What makes art is the sacred, that is meaning. The, the, uh, the confrontation, the, the, the opposition, the confrontation with, with the, uh, uh, the sacred. And um, so at, this, at that time, uh, you, uh, when uh, Georges Bataille was uh, looking into this, he didn't know the, the, all those details and also the differences between the different species and uh, how many humans and where did they come and what time and all this was not known. There was not much knowledge of that. It's the last 60 years and mostly 40 years that we've learned so much about evolution process, humanization and different species and time because of different uh, kinds of works we've been able to do, research and things. Uh, nevertheless, he pointed out something specific, the wonder, that human beings wonder. And when they are in a position that they don't understand, they do not understand, but they have to understand, or they are puzzled, then they express themselves. They're bound to do that. The desire of expression, that also arts, that they want to express themselves. They don't know exactly why. There is something new. They, are not on, they do not only want to have sex with somebody like an animal does. It's not that desire. It's actually when everything that seems to be simple, like drinking, uh, having sex, uh, uh, eating, whatever, all the, what you call needs, no longer are needs forever. It's done. Anything you do has to be reflected upon. When you, have to, when you come to that point and you're puzzled, how, it, how is it I need to drink? How is it I need to eat? Why should I eat? Is this proper? Eat, uh, why should I eat this food? Should I eat that food? 
or an, once the world of questions invades the collective brain that's called conscious of it, then you confront you are you have the desire to make sense, the desire to to create meaning, basically. To, uh, you don't know what, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the whole species now, I'm not talking about a person. You don't know what, um, why and how, but you cannot avoid being confronted with the issue. And the, um, this, I think, is really important because today we are experiencing uh, times where we also don't know in such uh, uh, in a manner that's pretty different from what we have experienced in a few generations and this is why I'm talking about art today we are in a state of crisis a crisis in a t is a time where you are no longer sure what the future will bring and you are no longer sure where you should go, what you should do, and everything that made sense in a specific way doesn't make sense anymore. Wherever you go, uh, you just uh, cannot figure out how to make sense of it. So everybody is looking for some ways. Some of them leave the city to live quite some place and uh, dig their own, uh, their own uh, food and, they, and don't want to watch TV or whatever. Some of them become vegetarians and uh, some others uh, uh, go into a religion uh, but all, all those people somehow are reacting individually to the issue because we are living in a time of individualism and the collective meaning is not functioning and normally, uh, normally well what we have experienced through the examples of Bataille and the others I will give is that a real crisis is not an individual crisis. It's a crisis at the level of the institution, of the making sense of the rituals that go for a whole society of humans. So what happened uh, in the south of France was quite interesting. 12,000 years ago, the level of the seas raised uh, 120 meters. That meant that those animals, those people were painting, left. They couldn't live there. Uh, some of them died, of course. It's the same, the history of the uh, Noah's Ark, the deluge, deluge. Yeah. That, you know, all the level went up. You have those myths in many places because the level of the sea. So people produce a lot of understanding about that. It's very common all over the world because this has been experienced. There came variations about those, those myths. A myth, of course, is making sense of where we come from and where we're going to. That's the definition of the myth in anthropology. So put, it, put it simply. Put it simply. Um, but this, this evolution of, um, of the level of the seas puzzled those people. They were used to fight against or hunt those animals. And now, they have to reorganize those who survived and it, it is not before 7,000 years for, before I mean, uh, from 12 to 7,000 there is no arts suddenly no production in those regions that's really interesting that the, the prehistorians tell us they were so puzzled they couldn't make sense so they were just in a state of uh, I don't know what I mean they, they, they had their sanctuaries, I suppose it, it was a kind of religion, I mean, you know, making sense, making rituals, and uh, like it's a church of some kind. And then suddenly everything changed, they don't know, the future and what it used to be. The, the past, nothing is how it used to be, that's a crisis. In a state of crisis, they are unable to produce new art. Well, we don't know everything, because maybe they were producing new ways of dancing or playing music, we don't know that. But their picture of arts, there's no trace. It is when they began to, well, they had to adapt, say, chasing rabbits, for instance, or ducks or birds, little animals. And that, uh, that uh, 
as a consequence, you have to organize in a very different way. If you go hunting big animals, you work, you work together in one way, and if you hunt little animals, it's another way. So, and also, uh, just, you, you, re you create new forms of communities, and of course you know the result of that, um, that at the moment of time, people settle down and organize uh, as uh, settlers, and after that, some of them begin to produce corns and live in the same places, and they did produce new kinds of arts. One of them was the Bible, uh, because if you, uh, it's interesting to see that the, the, the uh, what we call the sons of Abrahams, that is all, uh, all the, the religions that have this belief in one God and that have in common the, uh, the, from, from the place where the Neolithic came up in, in Iraq and Iran and those places first, uh, we now know uh, that they first settled uh, before we thought it was a country, <laughs> but they actually did settle somehow and, and decided not and to keep their community and then develop other ways of producing. That's an interesting thing because before everybody thought it was the reverse. It's, it's a debate between Colin Renfrew and Max Chauvin, for instance. No, not Max Chauvin, Chauvin. Uh, Remy Chauvin. Remy Chauvin, I think it's the name. Uh, Max Chauvin is one of my PhD students. <laughs> Uh, talking a different language and so on. So anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, what happened then was uh, uh, it, they began also to, as they were settler, settlers, they began to use the earth in a different way and, and made things they could keep. That is pottery. And that happened 7,000, minus 7,000. Uh, so all the myths that have pictures of God uh, taking a piece of clay and turning it into a man couldn't be, it couldn't exist before that time because humans didn't practice that. So all the, all the, the myth that you have, not about the deluge or the water, you know, all that water that came up, they, it's, they many, uh, many uh, tribes and people around the world had them. But the specific myth that you find in the Bible and in the books of Abraham and all this are connected to the settlers because they couldn't imagine such a thing. Of course, I'm sorry if some of you are believers that what's in the Bible is truth, but uh, I'm a scientist and this, uh, you have to cope with me like that. <laughs> I mean, I, um, we're not in a church, we're in a university. So uh, the university says, I, that's what I read everywhere, that it is impossible for the humans to, to uh, have produced any idea of the kind if it wasn't for 7,000 years ago. Um, they couldn't. They didn't even. Because you need to have the clay and, and to, know, to use the clay. And the using of the clay and making, making it in forms to make pottery, it is, uh, we now know that's minus 7,000, so 9,000 years ago. Um, we know that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before Christ. Uh, uh, so, uh, in in uh, what what uh, what happens then is they also begin to create totally different forms of arts, and one of them is dance rituals, churches, gods. Of course, it's also interesting. We also. And, and beliefs about what is to be done compared to those animals. What should we do with them? Same thing as before you had those, uh, those big animals, how to behave with those big animals. So you had to find out what you may do, what you may not do, whether maybe you should kill one of your kids or whatever, you know, sacrifice and all that's very strange things are to be found around the world. And one thing happened in, uh, with the Bible, with the Levitique, where it says that, uh, because people sometimes wonder, uh, how come uh, they, uh, we don't eat dogs and cats in France and places like that? And Mary Douglas explained that by going to the, to the Bible and, and says, look, it says in the, in the Old Testament, it says, uh, if you, uh, you shouldn't eat uh, animals that lap uh, when they drink, you are only allowed to, to eat animals who uh, when they drink. So dogs do that. Lapping, is that what you say in English? Yeah. Yeah. And sheep do, and so you may eat those. So it says there, no, it's, it says, it's written, 
And then people have, it's, it's what is called the sacred. The sacred is an organization. What do men do? And should you kill one? Should you sacrifice? Should you pay? Should you look at the stars? I mean, all this sense, it has been done in different ways. In, in the Aztecs or in the other side of the Atlantic, you know, they did that in a different way also. They were even, it's terrible the different ways. Sometimes for us, we find it really frightening what they could do with sacrifice. And of course, personally, I'm glad that uh, the, the, uh, the Catholic religion came up with this idea that you shouldn't sacrifice. Uh, that's, I find it nice. But as a scientist, I don't care here. I'm just explaining that what is the sacred about? The sacred and art is not only about painting walls. It's about making sense. It's about rituals, organizing. And today, we do have rituals. Uh, with art also, that we have those museum openings, we have this, those uh, songs and those big uh, events and with uh, people singing or, or performing and uh, some of them are really fantastic uh, in playing music. Uh, uh, I remember Men at Work, now that I'm here. Uh, <laughs> and, and there is also Gecko, how is he called this? Some young man who... Uh, Gautier. Gautier. How do you say that? Gautier. Gautier, yeah. Uh, that's also world-renowned world now because of his original way of uh, putting the rhythms together. Uh, so, and this is, this is of course, uh, uh, creativity and art. Um, but basically, or at the most fundamental level, um, what happens is in times where you change your ways, you interact in a different way you, between human beings, settlers or groups of big hunt, hunt, hunting together, maybe the females and the males together organizing, or other kinds of organizing where you have the females who stay longer with the kids, and that means that the kids can get to know each other and play together, and that means they will, will be friends for the rest of their lives, and they, don't, they, they are sorry when the other one dies and feel, have to understand what's going on here. The confrontation with death is something even more tough uh, uh, if people stay longer together. So the rituals about death, because human, no other uh, species, animals, do not reflect upon that. We have to make sense of it. So, uh, as Bataille explained, the sacred death and uh, eros and tanatos, it's also a very central issue in philosophy, of course, that we are confronted with that. How come we have this, this sexuality, how come we are going to die, how come we are dependent on this, dependent on our friends, sorry, when our mothers dies and fathers dies and all this. And the, uh, depending on how we organize at the moment of time, uh, the way we will put the, all the rest around will also change. And, for, and in, in, in between, when it doesn't make sense in the same way and something is attacked, uh, you have to make sense. Another example from the Bible, is that uh, some, someone came up with this idea, the last would be the first. Once you have this idea, and some people believe in it, and your community uh, gather together and say, we are exploited here on Earth, but we'll be the first in paradise. Those are the Jews. <laughs> this is genius. I mean, someone like I, I think, well, good idea, but I mean, why should you be the first? Or, you know, or others, there are so many different ways of doing that. But once, if you believe in it, it, you, it, it gives you a whole possibility of pre-producing images, understandings, and, and, and things. So there are some key issues, creative issues. And this thing, the one, the, the last would be the first, it's an art product. Because it's, it creates a whole sense. Um, so what's going on today? Today, after many years where our society could be compared with a big train. A train going fast towards future, adding at a future, a paradise on earth. We had this paradise in the sky when you die. That was the Bible. Then we got this new one, a new myth, in, in anthropological terms, the myth of paradise here on earth once we have developed. It couldn't be if we hadn't also an understanding that the earth is given to us in order to flourish. And that is something interesting. Because uh, Georges Bataille, when he uh, talks about those animals on the caves, 
he notices that there is a great humility towards animals. First of all, that you're not interested in yourself, you don't paint yourself, you don't paint your species, you paint the other animals. And there are many societies that pay great respect to the animals. Indian in uh, North America, before uh, people like us came uh, arrived there. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say that in a better way. I mean, people like us. Do you understand what I mean? Sorry. People from um, Christians uh, invaded <laughs> over there. Uh, they had a, a totally hum a humility towards the, uh, all the rest, all the other species. Uh, we don't have that. But again, one of the one of the uh, the package that goes with the clay and settled settlers and all this is that earth is for us to 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 use and make it grow. That is this is something common from the three big religions of the one God. Um, and once you have this idea, you, you, you tend to forget the limits of that earth. Of course, the earth is huge. There are 21 million people in Australia. Okay, well, there are three times as many in France. Uh, and France, you can have 11 times, 14 times in, the, in this continent, just for, as an example. Um, and uh, so it seems, and then you see, oh, we have a lot. Aha, but we have we have problems in Japan with at atomic uh, pr uh, uh, that blows up, I mean, the, the electricity uh, thing. Atom, atom nuclear. Uh, nuclear plant, nuclear plants in Japan. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're big, but the winds. Uh, the, oh, we have a lot of fish, yes, but in Japan, they don't care about the fish uh, population going down. For some of the fishes, you know that different ways of because they have another kind of relation to to nature. They have another way of making sense. I mean, I've, I've been in Japan many times, and I also have Japanese friends. And the way they can worship a tree, and at the same time don't care at all about trash or anything. It's really a very strange thing. And when you go into it, there are some very good books to explain the way they, the, the relation to nature is totally different. And uh, at the same time, you worship it, and at the same time, you don't give a damn. That's really, you, you can't think of it when you come from our tradition. But it, 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 just, it made just the same sense. The only problem is, as well as for Japan, as from, for Australia and France and other places, today we're experiencing a limit of this, this planet is for us to make use of and have society to, on tracks towards the future paradise here on earth when we have worked it out, you know. So uh, we had this myth of progress that came to an end in different phases. I have no time to give a description of the phases. I'm sure many people here know, know a lot about this. I'm just trying to put the, 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 main, the main idea about what uh, art is an important thing today and why the concept of art has to be understood uh, in order to make a distinction between innovations that do make a difference and innovations that don't, and innovations that can create a new meaning and those actually just reproduce the old and keep us on tracks and we go one, we are just in front of a big, 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 uh, no, what is it called, you know, uh, the end of the world. And cliff. Cliff, yes, and now we're just walking one path further. <laughs> yeah. Um, the difference of that is important to realize. So, at the um, um, the the way those um, um, the, the myth of progress was organized um, was that the earth had no limit. I mean, the exploitation of earth had no limit. Also, uh, everybody. Um, had uh, different cultures, now we have, we have to interconnect all of us, uh, some people call it globalization, whatever. Um, you also have the, um, I, I don't know, I, maybe I should give the, the whole list of, uh, of issues of the crisis. We also, for instance, believe that money well, could express uh, wealth. Uh, this is a really strange idea. <laughs> Um, and also uh, that more is better. I mean, there are so many things that went together. This is another lecture. <laughs> uh, 
cons consuming ourselves to death, to death, I call it. Um, but, um, but the crisis is when more and more people uh, somehow are puzzled. The financial crisis helped this. The fact that the, uh, the, the ice at the North Pole is reducing that much, that we are pretty sure that uh, the level of the sea will raise. <laughs> And that will be really interesting for many places, including Townsville. Um, we are pretty sure there are so many things that uh, the, the researchers tell us that uh, the climate might change because of what we've done, um, that we don't know whether we will have enough resources in order to change our computer every year. I'm so sad. Come on. This one is much better than the one I had last year. And I only have the, the iPhone number four. I mean, come on. Um, that if we will have the opportunity to use all this in order to keep on that track, that there are many, uh, there are many more and more uh, people that who realize that. Of course, some of them hide and, and just keep on to the track. And that the, that's somehow the issue. Uh, that we have um, creativity today that is used to um, avoid confrontation with facts and avoid alternative ways of organizing um, activities and relations between human beings, between the Earth, with the universe. And we have activities, and those are, in times of crisis, most wanted somehow for the, reason, for the sake of the species, and not only ours, that is trying to figure out how you can make sense, uh, institutionalize new ways, new ways of interaction, new ways of being friends, of being together, new ways of treating and using the earth and all this. And I think there is a big difference there. The main issue is that once you are in a time of crisis where the myth doesn't hold, there, the, there is no myth. That's why I call it the absence of the myth. The term comes also from Bataille. Um, that somehow, well, there was a myth. I call it the myth of economy, or the economy myth. That is, you reduce everything to, we have faith in the economic factor. And the economy is what makes sense. We always have had economy, we always had economy, and we organize our ways, and the, and the, the, uh, the big society is on tracks, and you have some ties under us, but the main thing is the economy is the locomotive, the, the, the engine at the top, and you burn all the resources in that locomotive, the, the engine, you burn it, and everything comes with it. I mean, you have first class, second class, you have even people falling out of the top of the train, but it, it goes. And, and underneath you had the, t the ties, and the ties, there was a left track and a right track, you could say, uh, to make it simple, left wing and right wing, left right, right track, but they had the same value somehow. They didn't realize that, because they had the same myth. They had some of the main components. Um, that, uh, that those are the ones that are going away. So this is why politics is so tough to deal with, because politics were organized at a moment of the ch uh, of uh, radical change. Also, where the, after the French Revolution, the English Revolution, the, the uh, also 1776 in uh, in the USA, um, 1688. Parliament in, in England, 1789 in France, <clears throat> and that uh, you had to make sense in a different way of the relations between what they call the classes then and, uh, <clears throat> and all reorganizing, leaving the countryside to go produce and uh, new relations, new families, then you create the trade unions, you're friends with the one who are in the same conditions, you're not friends with your church, with your village, I mean all this reorganizes at a moment of time. And uh, people who were together with uh, trade unions, they had one sense, and, and uh, it made sense also for the machine because the, the more those who were uh, trying to fight against the exploitation, they could have the raise of, the, uh, of their wage, they could raise the productivity, and it also helped the, those who, who had the capital and money. So every, whatever you did made sense together to develop this, uh, this society on tracks. 
but now, um, uh, as those ties, uh, the values, the basic understandings are not really there anymore, sometimes you don't understand why a left-wing person says such a thing that could be said to be right-wing and the reverse. You are no longer, no longer uh, uh, right-wing or left-wing, you just lost your wings, so uh, you cannot fly anymore. Or, or as I said the other day, I think uh, you are not left-oriented or right-oriented, you're disoriented. <laughs> So uh, the the time the in the time of crisis, uh, you the myth myth of progress it started of course uh, almost a hundred years ago, but pretty seriously in 1970s uh, and and became much worse a few years ago when we realized that uh, the planet is in big trouble. I mean the sustainability of the planet. Um, this create a situation of not knowing, uh, indecision. Indecision is uh, what characterizes a crisis. You don't know. And in such cases, radical imagination is needed. Um, so, instead of developing more energy into lapping, making more efficient some of the same tracks, I mean, organizing ways, more bureaucracy, uh, more efficient ways of producing cars, uh, whatever, just to give examples. We also need, I mean, I mean, we also, that's because I say, okay, if you want to find, to find out how to produce electric cars, fine with me, I, I will support that at a personal level. But that's not my issue today. My issue today is that's not enough, not at all. What you need is to understand the radical size of this crisis. It's an imaginary, it's a crisis of imagination. It's a crisis of the sacred. It's a crisis of the limit. We experience, for the first time in many years, death in a similar way as those people in the caves were experiencing. At that time, it was the first time their brains, according to what I said before, as Bataille said, he said it was the first. It was, uh, people, prehistorians now tell us it took a long time and, and it was about this period and it happened almost at the same time in many places around the world. So it is true that suddenly they could connect and they were confronted with death. What is this? And they had to make sense of it. Whereas the, uh, the animals uh, in the farm here, the door being open every day, and is anyone is happy, there is a guy coming with some food for me. But he never knows that one day, the same door, the same noise will mean he got killed and be eaten. Humans do. They do. They know that. Humans are in a situation that's almost comparable with the mafia people in the, in the terrible movie Goodfellas, where you have friends, and you make friends, you're very happy all the time, but in fact you know that your own friend can t kill you the next day. This is what makes mafia totally unacceptable for human beings, because you have no trust. We've lost trust. We're in a situation where we've lost trust. We don't trust anything somehow. We can, uh, we, of course we trust our friends, that's not the point, but somehow we are puzzled. We are in an, an anxiety. Anxiety is a gift from the gods to the human being because this is what makes us produce imagination and creative and that's fun and philosophers tell us that the meaning of life is that we don't know the meaning and that's fun to reflect upon, that's good enough. But this is difference between philosophy and uh, theology. But still, it's sometimes pretty tough and for many years, we had made sense of death. Uh, of course, we cannot accept it, but we were not confronted with it as a global level. For the first time on Earth, we are experiencing the, f the fear of death for the whole population, for the whole planet. And this is why I have this idea that it can be comparable to the situation human beings experienced 37 years, years ago in Chauvet, 
17,000 years ago in Lascaux, where not understanding what the meaning of death, they instituted the sacred and some kinds of rituals and some kind of sense making and way of being together and thanking the animals and whatever they did and created uh, representations and ways very basically grounded in their anxiety of what's going to be. If we don't give space enough and reflection enough for people to address the basic, most deep issues of creativity and imagination with relation to the confrontation of the uncertainty, then we are not helping anyone today. That was my point. Thank you. I didn't even hear you snore. I, 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 I played guilty. You played guitar? I have final. So I suppose. Um, Do you have time for questions? If you yeah, whatever. Have a question I'd like to ask. I suppose you could repeat your last sentence. <laughs> the main point, yeah. The main point is that, well, actually, I can read you. Uh, so, uh, I have made, first, I have made a presentation. So it circulates here. Man is an outstanding animal only because of its imagination. Art is a turning, at a turning point. That's what I said. Art is as fun as a deadly sin. Why? Because uh, art is, is when you, uh, uh, you have to play uh, with the sacred and, and, and art and everything. There is no limit and you are puzzled. Uh, <laughs> you have some limits, but you have to play with the limits. And this is something, it's fun and terrible. So human beings are always caught by this thing that they, they say, you may not do so. But in the moment you say you may not do so, then it becomes more attractive even. And so so it's, it's something that never ends. And this creates a lot of activity and artistic activity. Uh, to, um, before it says it's the unconscious consciousness and things. So same, because you are, you are conscious, but you are conscious of something that also works with behind you, the consciousness that Freud also works about. And all those issues, so I'm going through that because you will see at the end. Um, art is fundamentally about shaping visions and very closely related to the specific human ability to make projects. I said that you cannot control it. And then I talked about the crisis. OK. In times of crisis, this, you can read that maybe. You want yeah. to read it? Yeah. Read it. What? Read it. I can't say it. So. In time of crisis, the central signification can be said to be less sustained. Less sustaining and less sustainable. Institutional maintenance can even be said to be more a problem than a solution, as the institutional system is an essential part of the problem. That means that the institutions we have is, is a problem. We have great difficulty in figuring out what it should be, because we are used to it. We are live, we're living in it. But the, but we have to figure out what, how to solve that. And just like before, we had uh, suddenly we had those settlers and we create, they produced the Bible and they came up. By, by the way, if you don't know also, the, the seven days and everything, the, there were seven days because there were seven gods before in the religion that we had at that time. That's also been proved. They had the, the sun, the, 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 the sea, the wind. And, there was, and so it goes, it, we keep some of the old uh, ways of making difference, we keep using them for next, we will keep a lot of our understanding. We have to produce new ones. The institutional system was established in order to provide answers to now outdated questions. The answers provided not only do not fit newly arising questions, they make it difficult to address them. The old answers overshadow the new questions. There is a crack, but it is not enough to merely seal it. The crack is most likely not to fill itself. Radical creativity is required when facing such radically new problems. We need radical creativity because the nature of the problem we're facing are much more radical than those 100 years ago. We can say a lot about an injustice and, and mistreatment and of course, but what we're facing now is even worse than that. Uh, it's not just internal problems. It's a relation with the whole thing. So. Uh, 
and if uh, I can also where it's there. I can read um, a part of a chapter I wrote for my friend here. You, will you accept that? It's two page. Is it too much? Too much. Too much. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I can send you that. Yeah, please. Yeah, do, do that actually. Send it as a follow up. Um, yeah, I have a question about living in secular societies mm -hmm. and. Um, If there's a fundamental relationship between art and the sacred, and then, on the one hand, and between the sacred and production of means in society, it's assumed that that is the case. Mm -hmm. I take that to the um, And the worst possible existence for a human being is to live in a meaningless world. Yes. And uh, to the degree to which we do not, that's it. the degree to which we, we fail to produce great art, and then we're, it's a symptom of living in a world that is, um, to, to a degree, uh, stripped of meaning or is having difficulty creating meaning for itself. I think there are signs and symptoms that that's true of, of, our, own, of our own world. At the same time, we've gone through in the last 200 years of process of fairly aggressive secularization in society. Nobody goes to church or those kinds of things which are obvious symptoms of that. And yet at the same time, if I talk to most of my colleagues at the university, um, they would say, oh, this is a fantastic idea. We've got a bit of superstition. We've got a bit of nonsense. We've removed priests. We've deinstitutionalized. You know, just that and the other thing. It's all wonderful. It's all a fact progress, and progress is a marvellous thing, and we're advancing forward, and the world has become a more enlightened place, and yet at the same time, those same people uh, constantly tell us that the world is an unjust and oppressive place. I'm and nothing, this is the first page, not even the second. Yeah, the, the, world <laughs> is a the world is a terrible place, it's getting worse, uh, you know, we fail to deal with our ecological problems, our problems of, you know, social maintenance and all sorts of things like that. Now it seems to me that those people have a problem and the problem is that they do not understand the degree to which their own um, progressive view of the world is actually basically systematically gobbling up meaning uh, and um, not only through the secularization process but I think the secularization process is part of the story uh, that it has actually ruined our relationship with the sacred and therefore it has impaired our relationship with fundamental meaning. Um, and, I, and, I, and when I look around at the world that I inhabit, I regret the fact that I was born in my own time, which is filled with junk and rubbish and nonsense and Twitter feeds and more Twitter feeds and even more Twitter feeds. And I, I, I recommend people occasionally look at Twitter feeds to contemplate just how banal and stupid the world is capable of being. And I think that that's fundamentally got to do with the relationship with the same that you can on it. Yes, uh, it, it works um, in similar manners that what I ex explained today, that if you read uh, sociology, the history of sociology, the classics, you realize that the first, the, the first generation uh, of s the people thinking about society, like Voltaire and Rousseau and Hobbes and this generation, those generation, um, they were exactly like, like you said, very happy to get rid of superstition. And then came Durkheim yeah. and Mauss and uh, Simmel and Max Weber and Marx, uh, and they uh, somehow 
uh, produced evidence that there is no society without uh, what you call a religion. Mm. Uh, and the religion is the way of being together and relate to essential issues uh, yeah. that are called the sacred. Yeah. It doesn't exist. So, of course, the, the funniest part is that those who read Marx the wrong way, or didn't read Marx, or read, but read the Leninist that had made us, uh, another version of Marx, they end up putting religions that are even more close uh, and, and, uh, and strange because they, they removed uh, a lot of issues from, from that, but they are very religious uh, in, in the way they behave. Uh, Durkheim would show, of course, all the rituals, all those things. Um, and uh, what happened with the uh, modern society and industrialization and the uh, relation between what I call political economy, that is economy invaded and subsumed the political and the religious became the religions of economics, because we have, this is a religion we have, it's a kind of belief in all this, is that we uh, become blind to uh, deeper issues as the one I'm referring to. And this, this makes this uh, difficult uh, for, uh, for us to relate to uh, what we have to deal with, uh, the, the, the death and the sacred as I presented it then instead we consume more, or we develop more, or we put faith in technologies that will come. Uh, we develop uh, all the, those things because we keep inside the, the logic there. And then the less you, you, you have to do with religion, the more efficient you become for that logic. And those who are going to a church seems to belong to the former period. And they also do because it made sense then. But the, the, our religion is even, uh, even more regardless of the, 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 the deep issues. So somehow, uh, I follow you, if I get it right, I follow your point that some of those atheists, uh, if you put it that way, because you don't have to have a God, but, uh, are more uh, narrow-minded but, but, but some of those who actually dig some kind of, of religion in the old ways. It's very, it's very strange what happens. And anyway, I take it for granted that uh, a society without a relation to the sacred and a relation that's not on an individual base, but which, which has a collective level, that works at a collective level, uh, is in big trouble. And the, Today, we have developed a very strong individualism where everyone has to find uh, in him or herself meaning and uh, wants to be respected for that, and the rest doesn't matter much. Can I ask then a follow-up question? Because in, I mean, I suggest to you that art is in big trouble as well today. Um, that if I think of what I regard as the last period of the regular production of interesting or great art. It takes me back, let's say, to the 1950s. People like Henry Moore, the sculptor, or Mark Rothko, the painter, and so on. And, and characters like that, it strikes me, still had a, or Arthur Boyd in, in Australia's case, and so on, still had a substantive and clear relationship with the sacred. Many of their works yeah. um, spoke directly to, to, to the sacred. In fact, I think Rothko, for me, is the great um, religious painter of the 20th century in many respects. That's disappeared mm -hmm. and I think the converse is that I have to say is I'm continually, not universally, but regularly disappointed with uh, the, the artwork of, of the last 40 years. It's, it's much of it is shabby, uninteresting and I think reflective of the general junk of the larger society. Yes, but you care to comment. Yes. Am I being grumpy on me? No, 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 I don't think so. <laughs> when you said that yesterday, I, I, don't, I, I can recognize some of the people who were there. And, uh, but I'm, I'm this, listening a response yeah, from you. It's, it's, Am I, is this true or is this false? It, well, I would... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm putting you on the spot here. No, no, it's, it's not. I would... Uh, um, I, I, well, I, it was difficult for me to explain all this in a sh such a short time. <laughs> but but um, the problem is that 
it's a subsumption. The, the, that art becomes subsumed to this logic of individualism, production for consumption, production, accumulation, and all this. So most of the creativity is taken uh, to to serve a, uh, either individualism or consumption, production, or both at one time. Whereas people like uh, Antonio Machado, the great poet, or uh, René Char, for take some of the great French guys, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, or Lorca in Spain, well, or Thomas Mann, uh, the great writers, I mean, uh, all the, uh, Marcel Proust, uh, all those, I don't know, you can give the list, uh, um, they were not addressing uh, so narrow issues. They were reflecting upon, for instance, Proust, what is time, how come? Uh, how come I cannot forget my grandmother? I mean, that's about the book. It's, it's such a big book. It's about his grandmother somehow. There's a lot of other things, but uh, he's puzzled by that. She was so nice, my grandmother, you know. And, and how come I behave like you jerk with this uh, woman there? It's not him. It's, uh, it's uh, people uh, in the play, in the, in the, in the novel. But reflections about what's, what's the meaning of this, how come I cannot conform myself, how come people behave so strangely about their sexuality and things. Those are issues of wonder, yeah. wonder, wonder. Uh, and the sacred, it basically, it's wonder about the limits and the desire. Desire uh, now is only, the, uh, it, it's of course desire, as we know from other the uh, theoreticians like Girard, Lacan, and others, it's a desire of the other. So you com you look at the other people and what they want and how, how they act, and, and you have to come somehow to get your identity through that. And it was also like that made, uh, from in Lascaux times, I guess. But um, it's, uh, the others were also um, uh, inspired by some people who came up with greater ideas than just producing a new car. Or a show, see what I dare do, and I put a shark in a in a, in a, in a exhibit and sell it for a lot of money. Uh, and see, I did it. It's, it's, it's my. I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. So the answer is yes. Uh, I'm really. Uh, uh, I think we have to make a distinction between art that address the fundamental issues of mankind at a time in a time of crisis, and those who just. Have, uh, can be compared with, with what you see in a supermarket. And a supermarket never addresses uh, fundamental issues. So you have supermarket art, and that's the most, and then you have art like Marcel Proust and the uh, people you mentioned. And today you have less of those. And this, uh, well, anyway, we haven't found them. Maybe they are somewhere. Tiny. <laughs> yeah. So. It was from Again? What's wrong with Hockney? He's still alive. He's still doing that. You answered that one. <laughs> I, but, uh, I, you well, had it on your. No, I did. And, 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 and I think it's, you know, I, I, it's the there, there, there are there is great art or significant art and good art produced, mm -hmm. uh, just less of it, and 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 okay. visibly less of it. But I, I'm not a specialist of art. I'm very fond of art. Uh, I have visited the art museum for all my life, and I, uh, I am very interested in that. I've been book about art, but I'm not as Peter specialist of art. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is that uh, a lot of art has been colonized by marketing. That is, uh, it follows the logic of marketing, and then it becomes something else. You see, there is a fundamental difference between marketing and art. If you see a beautiful, beautiful painting, whatever, and it says Kodak or Fuji color or whatever, you know, then art has been reduced to marketing. Why? Because art is an open window or a black mirror. Uh, uh, then it, it, it puzzles you, it asks you questions, it addresses even your unconsciousness. I mean, it's, it opens to the wonder, the wondering and the wonder, wonder. Whereas advertising catches your attention and gives you the answer. So the window is not, is, is not open. It is just, it's not even a mirror. It's uh, just a very narrow crack there and tells you 
Fuji film, go and buy it. And then the fact that if they show you a Picasso, you cannot watch the Picasso, yeah. you have already stopped. Yeah. And it, it is also that's one of the... That's marketing. That's not art and good art and, and artists and people creating art. Is, that's not marketing is a whole different organ. That's what I say. It's like they, Tom Wolfe when he wrote that book about yeah. art. So, yeah. Yes, but then we, we say about the same, as I hear you say. Because I said we have to, to explain this difference, make it clear that uh, there shouldn't be, for, for instance, they show movies interrupted with, with ads, or they show movies in theaters and they sell popcorn. This reduces the possibility for people to go through this window to wonder and look that mirror because they hear somebody eating just next door, or they remember this and that, or they are or they are interrupted in the middle of something that they are taken away and uh, good movies, artistic movies, and then both interrupted and you're back there. How can you wonder that, I mean, go away from your everyday life in such a little detail like a movie? If you have it like in the US, when I was in New York last time, it took me a long time to find the only channel where there was not uh, ads every 10 minutes. Uh, this creates a new kind of man somehow. Whereas if you are, caught by, by the creativity of artistic creation, you don't want the, the window to be closed or to, to be narrow. I'm not denying there is art. Uh, what, how should I know how, how much good art there is? I'm, I'm saying that even those who are good artists uh, are, uh, have to follow the logic of marketing today. And most of them uh, who are successful, they have to follow it very, very, very narrowly. Um, so you even hear about them as person instead of the subject or uh, I mean a poem for instance uh, you, you can just listen also to what they, uh, when you listen to the words in many this is how poems are market today how many people uh, uh, do write good songs yeah <laughs> we have third, Leonard Cohen one of them the third, the third has arrived I can see it now corner of my eye there. So, but be, be, before we head for the food, um, it, and, um, You have one more pitch. Hey? No, 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 you, I want to know... You are welcome, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I have, can I just ask a oh, question? Yeah. yeah. So, if the sacred sort of, we, we all believe, or we don't all believe, but there's pathology right the way through history, mm. ever since, I mean, There'll the caves that you were talking about, and in northern Western Australia yeah. 40,000 years ago, yes. the caves there yeah. um, are full of figurative work. Yes. So they didn't just do them. Yeah. And they show evidence of the, um, the sea rising, just as you were saying, mm. because they've gone through scientifically and proven that these animals were drawn over those animals and there's a gap of 70,000 Precisely. I've read those articles. They're yeah. really great. And it was too um, fast there. Those kinds of things. So that's a disclosure of the sacred. Mm. Precisely. Oh, precisely. And what, what the pieces that you were talking about, Peter, mm. are disclosing the sacred. Yep, that's right. So, you know, do you think then that unless uh, artists consider a disclosure of the sacred, Peter as well, I'm asking, that it, it isn't, uh, and, and not worrying about the materialistic nature of selling and so forth, that um, it creates better art? I, I am advocating for a respect of the concept of art at the deepest level, for the respect of the concept of sacred at a deeper level than, I agree the, that, than, than the one that most people use. They talk about religion and sacred as being the same thing. Sacred is the consciousness of the limits and the, the desire of making sense. The religion is a way of f freezing that, an answer to that, that makes sense at a moment of time for a group of people. So it's an institutionalization of a question. The same thing with art. Art is... Um, uh, 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 the expression of the desire of making sense the, uh, that is motivated by the sacred somehow 
and um, the same way you are motivated to make to produce food, but you can make food that you want to have to to have together and have a dinner and you have nice experiences with your friends, and you can also have food that that you just want for yourself and you have no time to to have. Uh, to speak with your friends. Like you can be a tourist that goes from one hotel to the other and never talks with anyone else than those who are at the Hilton. And um, in the same way with art, in the same way with art, you have uh, concepts, but you have to explain what's, what's the most important thing. About tourism, there are two, the different kinds of tourism. There are some people who, how oh, I spent something else. It puzzles me. Got new, uh, new visions, new understanding. It's uh, wow. And you have others that just want to have the same kind of service, the same the same kind of waiters. And if they are, do not talk English, then they are not good enough. And if I, if and, and if I go there, I'm more safe going in McDonald's because then I know it's uh, it's uh, it must be safe because uh, otherwise the reputation is over. Then I won't taste anything else. In the same way with art, you have. Um, you have to make distinction, and they are even deeper than the ones I'm making about tourism. They have to do, there is something fundamental. You should mix up desire and need, you should mix up art with a big A, and, and uh, aesthetics and, and creativity. And so I say, more artists, if in schools, in creative schools, engineering, whatever, you also t um, uh, have courses that explain that we, have, we need to have imagination that are addressed to the issue of the collective death and we make it legal to talk about it, then we are uh, somewhere further. I mean, instead of hiding it and, uh, and uh, just uh, trying to contribute to uh, new iPhones and uh, as I said earlier, we also say we want people to address those issues. What do you have to say about it? Challenge uh, great artists, challenge great writers, there are people who do that. There are some novels that, that are above uh, uh, the level of others uh, that address uh, fundamental uh, issues of today. Uh, and there are some that are just uh, talking about uh, sexual relations or a way to impress each other or, you know, uh, past time. Does, does that answer you? It does. Yeah. I, I kind of have diff different views and you know you say religion is closed well I, I disagree with that because it's advancing all the time but I do agree totally that it's a mythological thing um, and it is built on society but there's historical proof as well in some religions and so they're built on that history but it's, it's not those because, you know, a lot of them are even going through and seeing yeah, that crisis and that change. No institution can ever be closed. It can't be closed. No, no, that's a no. sociological fact. They, yeah. they, they, no institution. But there is a fundamental difference between the uh, art and science yes. and religion. That's right. The sci uh, art and science are using questions to come with answers that give new questions. So, and that is conscious. That is, you you value questions higher than answers in art and in science. So, science is an art form. Whereas religion, you value answers higher than questions. So, the the, the worst example. I, I hope I'm not shocking anyone. But the worst example. Wait a minute. The worst example is Jehovah's Witness. Witness. He comes on Saturday and he says, you have a question. I have the answer. And they want to buy that answer and I, to believe that I, answer. I have the answer. Yeah, <laughs> I have the answer. So the, 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 that's why I say religion try to come up with an answer a moment of time and they try to keep it. The, the, the effort that's within, within, yeah, within the institution, with, of course, within the institution, the religion tends to be fundamentalist, as you say that it cannot be, even in, in this worst example of, it cannot be, I totally agree, they cannot, they cannot succeed, it's impossible. But there is a kind of uh, eager and uh, anxiety, that, uh, eager to, to keep that anxiety away, it's an anti-anxiety thing. Whereas science and art says, let's go for anxiety, it makes things develop, it makes things go further. There is an addressing front to the anxiety, 
I mean, that, like philosophy does the same. Well, meaning, but well, we, don't, we don't know, but still it's fun to work with the issue. This is a radical difference. Have you got a response to it? Come on. He he wants to take, take him on. Take him on. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's, it's totally open-ended, yeah. you know, and it has to be. Yes. Know, that's why I say it's, it's not private. No, no, we agree on that, but there is a, the, the yeah. intention and the departure is different. Yes, so if, right. if for those people who come to solu religious solutions today, if, uh, if I think the sacred is an important thing, but that doesn't mean we have to, to give more uh, room for the ex existing religion, because they will tend just to be very conservative and go back. You see also the reactions yeah, of fundamentalists in, in the US and also in Islam. It's that's a reaction, and this this is going to be terrible. I mean, if it if they come more and more like this fundamental, then there's no chance that that anything will be solved. All right. Can we take, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much.